When you have it, say amen. Jude don't have but one chapter, so you don't have to worry about looking for a chapter. So just go to the first verse. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them like them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also, filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael and the archangel, when he contended with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beast. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for the reward, and perished in the gang saying of Kor. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I, I admonish you this week to read this whole chapter. And because I believe that, that it is very important for us, this is a letter from Jude. So today I want to just talk about a letter from Jude. Jude was the brother of James, which was also the brother of Jesus Christ. They were half-brothers, of course. God was the father of Jesus, not, not uh, Joseph. But Mary had other children after the birth of Jesus. They consummated their marriage. They had other children. In fact, most of the of the family of Jesus did not really believe that he was the Christ until after his resurrection. James came into believing after the resurrection that Jesus was the Christ and, and eventually became the, uh, the, the apostle, the chief apostle of the church in Jerusalem. So Jude comes into the belief in Jesus and he admonishes them, and I think this, this is, this book, this letter is so apropos for us today. It is, it is, it should speak to us today because it is, it, it is as if he's, he's, he's writing as an apostle to the church today and admonishing them 
to contend or to fight, to be willing to do warfare over the faith. He says in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave the diligence to write unto you the, of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. In the Amplified Translation, it says, Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regard to our common salvation. But I found it necessary and was impelled to write you and urgently appealed to, the, uh, to and exhort you to contend for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith which is that sum of Christian beliefs which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God. I believe with all my heart that we are in a fight for the faith. The enemy is not, is not concerned, he is not concerned about whether we prosper as much as he is concerned about whether we are confused or whether we leave the foundations of the faith that has been once delivered, that we get away from the foundations of truth, the foundations of the word of God. He is more concerned about that because if he can get you to be confused about the word of God, he can get you off track. He did it with Eve in the beginning. When Eve said, when he said to Eve, Eve said, God said, don't eat of the tree. Don't even touch the tree. And he said, uh, and he contradicted God's word. He said, God, you're not going to die. You are just going to become wiser than you ever been before. You're going to know stuff you didn't know before. You're going to be wiser than anybody else. And she fell, and Adam fell also. So he's more concerned about our, our faith. Now, I just want to say this. First of all, the foundations of our faith. The Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And so we must remain firm on the foundations of our faith. First of all, uh, the foundation of our faith is, praise God, is rooted in the Word of God. Now, the Bible, the Bible, the Word of God, we believe, uh, our faith says that the Bible is the Word of God. It does, we, it, we are not saying it contains the Word of God. It is the Word of God. And, and if that foundation is destroyed, then, praise God, then others can begin to tell us that there's other books and uh, and that, and that some of it is God's word and some of it is not God's word. So they can pick and choose and change and, and praise God and distort the word of God to, to say whatever they want it to say. This is foundational. This is the word of God. The God we serve is the God of the Bible. Everybody talking about God is not talking about the same God. And we need to understand that, that because when the first thing that, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the world wants to do is they want to discredit the word of God. They want, and they only want to use enough of the word of God to confirm or substantiate their own lifestyle and their own way of living. And so we need to understand that, that so whenever somebody starts talking about, you know, uh, contrary to God's word, the first thing I want to know is that do you believe that this is the word of God? If you don't believe this is the word of God, we have no common ground in which, which to, I mean, we can be nice to each other, we can have coffee together, but praise God, but you can't convince me that this is not the word of God. Men were moved by the spirit of God. The Bible says that holy men, the Holy Spirit came on them and the, and the word of God was given to them. The word is God breathed. It's, it's the breath of God. It's the word of God. And so uh, if you don't believe that, then your faith is in vain. So we must believe that, that this is the word of God. We must believe, praise God, that Jesus, there are certain tenets of our faith. First of all, that, that, that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin. 
He was God manifest in the flesh. He was born of a virgin. Praise God. He was, he was, uh, he, he lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He was buried in three days. He rose from the dead. That's the tenet of our faith. And so that's the faith that was delivered to the saints, the resurrection of Jesus, the sinless life of Jesus, salvation through none other than Jesus Christ. That's foundations of our faith. Jude was dealing with Gnosticism. He was dealing with uh, the, the, the doctrine that had come out talking about a gaining a higher uh, esoterical knowledge that would bring you in unity with God apart from Jesus Christ. But the, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. Now, I know that's kind of dogmatic, and, ever, and people have problems with that. You know, they want to have their own truth. But this is the truth. And, and I believe that all this warfare over trying to make America Christian, when, when I think we ought to try to make the church Christian, if we can get the body of Christ to be Christian, then we've done. Then we'll have something. We'll be a city that's sitting on a hill that cannot be hid, and folks will want what we have. But when we are hypocrites, and when we don't even believe what we're supposed to believe, we don't even walk in the Christian uh, 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 foundations and truths, praise God, they look at us, and they don't want what we got. I don't mean that we're perfect, but we ought to at least believe what we believe and stand for what we stand for. Amen? I think our warfare is over. Our warfare is, is, is to get the church to fight, to remain committed to the foundations of our faith and live our faith so that, praise God, we can be an example to the world. We are supposed to be light and salt. Thank you, Jesus. So as I was praying about what I should share today, the book of Jude came, came to my mind, and, and, I, and I think it's so very, very apropos that we we get back to believing what we're supposed to believe. Get back to believing the foundations of our, of our faith. That we get back to, to, to believing that the Bible is the word of God. That we get back to believing that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is not a way. He's the way. And I know our nation wants to, us to believe that Whatever religion you have and whatever God you have, whatever you believe about God is okay as long as you believe in God. But let me say this to you. Do you believe in the God of the Bible? Because the God of the Bible, when you read the God of the Bible, you'll learn, praise God, that there's some things God does not uh, condone and there's some things that God condones. The God that we serve in the Bible is not a God that just, praise God, allows all behavior, all kinds of things, all kind of sin and, and degradation. Uh, Christ died. It cost God his life to redeem us and to change us and to cleanse us and praise God. And if it cost God, if God had to go to the extent of giving his life then then sin is a killer and we need to know that God is against he he hates sin he loves the sinner he hates sin and let me get to some of the things I want to share today he's he he now Jude is writing this letter because of the rise of these those that are 
that are co coming against the faith. They're, they're, they're not staying true to, the, to, to what the Bible says, true to what it, about Jesus. And he goes on to say, I'm going to read in the, in, in the uh, Amplified Translation. Uh, he says in verse 4, For certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining entrance secretly by a side door. Mm. It didn't come in the front door. They came in the side door. Their doom was predicted long ago. Ungodly, impious, profane persons who pervert the grace, the spiritual blessing and favor of our God into lawlessness, wantonness, immorality, and disown and deny our soul master. Now, this is so very, very important, and I, and, and I say this as an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm a defender of the faith. I'm a defender of the Bible. I'm a defender of the church. And one of the things is, is that he talks about here that they have perverted the grace of God. I believe that the perversion of the grace of God is one of the greatest enemies to the church. They are perverting God's grace. God is a good God. He loves us. The grace of God has to be taught correctly in order for us, praise God, to be able to walk as God desires us to walk before him. The grace of God, the favor of God cannot be changed and made into a, a license to do anything you want to do. See, that's what he's saying. In essence, he's saying, the, he's saying that, that they pervert the grace of God, the spiritual blessing of the favor of God into lawlessness and wantonness and immorality and disown and deny our soul. In other words, the grace of God. God, you're saved by grace, and therefore you don't have to do nothing. You can live, you can be a murderer, you can be a, a, a rapist, you can be a, 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 you know, you can be all, you can, you, can, you can conduct yourself in any way you want. The grace of God just covers you. We had one of the, one of the most, uh, uh, celebrated men of God in years past, black man of God that came out with this doctrine called ultimate reconciliation. And, and it is a perversion of the grace of God. And what, what, did he, what he said was, he said this, he said God gave him. Now he started out in the Christian faith and and in the and 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 and, and in the Pentecostal tradition. Uh, praise God, a man of God. But see, if you're not careful, Satan, Satan will will take advantage. He will take advantage of your pride. He'll take advantage of your, uh, your faults. Now, let me just say this, because I want to I wanna deal with this for a minute, this, this grace issue. I want it on tape. I want it on YouTube. When I'm dead, I want folks to be looking at this and praise God. And the next generation will be looking at it and saying, wait a minute, that, that, that's, uh, that, make, that, 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 that message uh, brought me back. From just just believing that I could do anything and still be saved. Mm. He he came around. He he started teaching ultimate reconciliation. What he said was this: is that God has Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sins. Therefore, we are all saved. We just don't know it. He said that the, the Muslim is saved, the Hinduist is saved. He, just, he said all of them are saved, they just don't know they're saved. Because see, God has, Jesus has, oh, he, he died for the sins of the world. He paid the price for the sins of the world. So therefore, we are all saved. 
Now that might sound to, to, to those that are, that are founded in the gospel, we know that's wrong. We knew that was wrong when we heard it, didn't we? We knew that was wrong as two left shoes. But the, but the thing is, is that how is it that a man of God that, is, that, that, that has been raised in Christian faith, knows the foundation, been to a Christian university, taught theology, uh, and, and so on, would come to that conclusion? And the Bible says, because the love of the truth was not in them, they were deceived. You got to love this even when it rubs you the wrong way. I got to love it when, when my life don't measure up to it. I got to still love it. Because there is no change until you are willing to look at the word of God, like James said, like a mirror and see your stuff and say, I ain't there yet, but God, I know you right and I'm wrong. Holy Ghost, help me. Spirit of God, work with me. Blood of Jesus, cleanse me until I get it right. Because you can get to the point where you're, you do wrong so long until you just think, well, it must be okay. I can't, it must be all right. In other words, I'm going to change my doctrine now. Lying ain't sin no more. Whoremongering ain't sin no more. Not, 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 I don't, I'm not trying to get into uh, to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'm telling you, the word of God, the grace of God has two sides to it. And if you don't teach two sides of the coin, let me tell you something. You can go in and, and, and you can make, you can go in and, 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 uh, and try to spin a dollar that don't have both sides. In other words, praise God, you got one side of the dollar. With what is it, Washington or whoever's on it, and nothing on the other side, you can't spin it, can you? The reason you can't spin it is because there's two sides. There's two sides to a quarter. There's two sides to a nickel. There's two sides to a penny. There's two sides to grace, and we need to understand that the perversion of the grace of God is the greatest attack on the body of Christ right now. There, there are preachers that, praise God, that, that live any kind of life, do anything they want to do, do all kinds of sin, and praise God. And, and the, th the thing that gets me is people are following them. Crowds are following them. It's amazing how we can change our doctrine when we want to do what we want to do. I, one preacher, and I'm, I'm not calling no names, but one preacher was saying, you know, you know, the Bible talks about, and I know I'm going to step on some toes now, and we in deliverance have known this. We've cast out demons with people with all kind of tattoos. Oh, Lord, I want you to move. We've cast out demons out of people that, that with markings on their bodies. The Bible actually has scripture talking about markings on your body. Now, I know it's quiet in here now. I've cast out demons. I, I remember one time we had a young lady come, and she was having some issues, and she comes up, she got all these tattoos on her. She wasn't saved, but she had all these issues. And the Lord, and then she had some kind of a, a necklace on that she didn't know was representative and was something that's dedicated to a deity. To a, to a, um, and so we were casting devils out. I had to cast devils out. I had to have her take off that, that ungodly jewelry and had to cast demons out of her. And, and, and a lot of that was related to all of the symbols and stuff that she had put on her body and it was really dedicating those symbols were dedicated to evil spirits 
I, I know, and I, I don't get me, now don't, I, I, I'm not, look, I don't care about your favorite television preacher. I don't care about your favorite president, uh, television teacher. You, so the same, the, I, the, one, of the, one of the individuals, the same, come out of a deliverance church, know better, but now all of a sudden is promoting all of these demonic symbols on your, somebody said, well, I put on there this, I don't put a demonic symbol, you shouldn't have no symbol. Oh, Lord. What is, what is going on? What is, what is that all about? That's about pride. That's about, and what, why do you have it in places you want folks to see? Oh, Lord, okay. I, lock the doors. You're going to hear this before you go. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be more, you know, holier than thou, but I'm saying some things, you know, when we know better, I'm not talking about, some people don't, they had not known better and they, you know, may have, you know, and, and uh, God, you know, but when you knew, know better, here it is, I know better, I didn't cast out demons that were related to that, then all of a sudden now, and I, now I'm going and getting them. It's because I want to do what the world is doing, and therefore I got to make it all right. So I can't go by the Bible anymore because the Bible says don't make markings in your body, but I can't go by that anymore. So I have to come up with, you know, that's under the old covenant. Look, the whole Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament is the word of God. As if the Old Testament is not the Word of God, but the New Testament is the Word of God. Give me a break. It's the whole Bible. And we must be, we must fight for the faith. We must stand for the faith. As an apostle, I've got to stand for the faith. I gotta preach the truth. I gotta demand, I gotta tell you, this is God's word, this is God's way. You do it God's way, praise God, and praise God. And if you are wrong, God will forgive you, God will change you, but you can't say now it's right. He be, said they they have perverted the grace of God, and I am concerned. As a man of God, I'm concerned that, that I'm, I'm hearing this grace message being taught over television and over the media. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all of it is not, but I, what I'm saying is, is this, is that that was the same edge that this other brother was dealing with. See, see when you don't get the other side of grace, See, grace is God's favor, but it's also God's power. The Bible says in Titus, the grace of God hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The grace not only is gives you is the favor of God, but it's the power of God to live the kind of life God wants you to live. And if you got a problem, ask God for more grace in your life in that area, and he'll give you the power to overcome it. He told Paul, he said, Paul, Paul said, this thorn in the flesh, he said, my grace is sufficient. My grace has enough power to get rid of every demon, every devil, every sickness, every disease, every sin, every fault, every shortcoming will be dealt with with my grace. You can get enough grace to deliver you out of anything that you are in involved in you just ask God give me some more grace but I'm not talking about just the favor oh this this is the kind of grace oh just go ahead honey you all right no the grace that says 
I'm going to give you the power to overcome that thing. So Judah's saying they perverted the grace of God and made it lawlessness, made it they can do anything they want to do. That's what's being, that I see some of these preachers that are teaching that. I'm concerned because I'm thinking they're on the edge. Because that's what that other brother was teaching. Teaching about the grace of God. Then all of a sudden it's ultimate reconciliation. Now there is no need for you to confess Christ. There's no need for you to be washed in the blood of Christ. Because he, he dealt with all sin. And we have no, there's no more consequences for sin. Lord, let me read a little bit. Verse, verse 5 says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, okay, he brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. In other words, he brought them out. When they stopped believing, he destroyed them. Now, let me also say, do you believe, when you say you believe in God, when people say they believe in God, I ask them, do they believe in the God of the Bible? I want to know if you believe in the God of the Bible. The God that, <laughs> that, that, that not only, praise God, saved Israel, but gave Israel laws and govern them by some laws that destroyed them. You got to know the goodness and the severity of God. And, they, and so he, he goes on to say, he brought them out, but when those that didn't believe, he destroyed. Look at verse 6. And the angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, last month was Pride Month. The Bible says God hates a proud look, a haughty spirit. That, and now they're trying to say that God is okay with homosexuality, lesbianism, that God is okay with it. Somebody got to fight for. Now, now, the, now the, prop, the, the thing is, is that we know in the world, they're going to do what the world do. My issue is what's happening in the church. I saw a preacher on, uh, on, on, on YouTube talking about condoning the gay lifestyle. And God, you know, God, yeah, God loves the gay just like he loves a sinning, homongering straight. <laughs> <laughs> he loves he loves us but that behavior is not condoned by God it is fornication it is perversion and God is and, and, and Jude is saying here look you remember Sodom and Gomorrah when they turned to fornication turned to strange flesh he said that the vengeance and the, of God that came upon them. Look, I've got relatives that are in that lifestyle. And I love them. They don't know how much I love them. I love them. But I cannot tell you that that is righteous. I cannot tell you that God condones that. No more than I can tell you that God condones uh, 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 sex between a man and a woman outside of marriage. That is called fornication. It ain't, and, 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 and it's adultery if it's a married person, and, and praise God. And so let's quit, let's call it what it is, and quit calling it uh, an affair. 
You ain't had no affair. You're an adulterer. That's what the Bible says. If I do it, I'm an adulterer. Somebody got to fight for this stuff in the church. This is this, because this ain't this ain't outside. This is now coming in the church. Whole church is full of gay folk. Just because you got a building and call it a church, it ain't a church. He's telling you Sodom and Gomorrah stuff. That's happening right now. The thing that's so sad is, is, that, is that the church is now embracing this stuff in many churches. It'll never be here. We'll love them. They can come. We'll love them. Just like I love all y'all fornicators and adulterers. Now y'all liars and God doesn't condone that just like he don't condone that. And we have to tell the truth. And so when, when people say, you know, and sometimes they'll do this. This is, this is their thing is that when you tell them that, they say, that's your truth. No, that's the truth. Oh, Lord. So he's, he's look, this looks like he's writing it to us right today, right to the church. Even Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. Lust is just, it, it ain't nothing but the nature of Satan. The nature of Satan is lust. Lust can, is an unsatiable desire that cannot be fulfilled. It will never be fulfilled. It's like a bottomless pit of desire that can never be satisfied. Love, praise God. The Bible says, uh, love against love, there is no law. Because love, you can have as much love as you want. So when you start talking about, it's, it's, y'all shouldn't be condemning me for who I love. If that is love, that's a distorted sense of love. Because you know what? If sex is love, who you have sex with is, and sex is love, then that means that in order for me to love my grandchild, I got to have sex with them. How perverted, how low. You can't define love by sex. Even in a marriage, the sex is not love. It, it, you know, I'm making love. You ain't making love. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me today. I'm going to stop. I'm meddling big time. But I got, you got to tell, we got to tell the truth. When I was bound as a young Christian with certain sins, one of the things that I think the reason God delivered me from those things is because I had enough sense to not be having, uh, not be denying that I'm sinning. I knew what sin was. I knew I was doing wrong. I didn't try to say it was right when it was wrong so God could help me. But anytime you start saying right is wrong and wrong is right, God can't help you. Your mind is saying that what you're doing is right when it is wrong. Don't get me wrong. God will help you. Jesus died for your sins. He died for, he died for homosexual sins. He died for heterosexual sins. He died for all of the sins of the world. And his grace is sufficient enough to deliver you from anything that you're involved in. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I didn't even get to my message. I, wanted to, I had a good message now in verse 11, but I didn't even get there. So we, so we, need, to, we need to contend for the, and believe what the Bible says. We got to believe what the Bible says about lying cheating, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. We got to believe what the Bible says about it. I, 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 when I, as a young believer, I struggle, just like many of you struggle in areas. 
but I had enough sense to know that I was struggling. I didn't normalize it and say that just, you know, this, this must be the way, it's go, the way it is. The Bible must be lying now when it says, you know, you know, you've been listening to too many of them secular songs. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> Caught up in the world. <laughs> Let me, okay. Verse 8 says, likewise, they also filthy dreamers. Nevertheless, I'm reading in the Amplified. Nevertheless, in like manner, these dreamers also corrupt the body, scorn and reject authority and government, and revile and, uh, uh, and, and libel and scoff at heavenly glories and the glorious ones. So, again, they corrupt their bodies. They go after the flesh. They despise authority. In other words, they don't want to be under nobody's authority. You know, it, they, they, they rebel against leadership. Now, let me, let me close because I've, I've already made everybody mad here and <laughs> on social media and they're already picketing the church. <laughs> Verse 11 is what, really what I wanted to talk about. I was going to talk about that. I wasn't going to get into these other things, but, but you know, it's, it's just difficult when you're talking about this letter. You need to read this whole letter, but look at the 11th verse. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and they perish in the gang saying, of Korah. Somebody say, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. This, when you, you can find the, the, um, uh, the infection that's in the church by looking at these three men and how they conducted themselves. And this is one of the main enemies. These are the main enemies. Talks about the way of Cain. Most of us know the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis. It talks about that, that Cain uh, brought to the Lord an offering from his, the fruit of his ground and offered it to the Lord. It says that Abel brought a firstling of his sheep and offered it to the Lord. It says that God accepted Abel's offering. He rejected Cain's offering. So Cain got upset. And God gave him another chance. God says, why are you distraught? If you do well, if you, if you, if you do it the way I want you to do it, I'll accept it. But what God was saying is, I don't accept anything and call it, praise God, an offering. I don't accept anything. You don't just bring anything to me and just offer anything to me. I'm God. And if you don't do it my way, you, I, I don't accept it your way. Your truth is not good enough for me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what Cain was doing, Cain was offering of the fruit of the ground. First of all, God had cursed the ground. Secondly, God required a blood sacrifice. In other words, don't bring me no greens and bring me no banana. Don't bring me no, bring me something that's got some blood in it because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And 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 the uh, his their father and mother had taught them that. Don't you know Adam and Eve told them the story, said when we sinned, God killed an animal and put his, the, 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 the covering uh, uh, fur of the animal around us. In other words, he was demonstrating that in order to cover sin, you got to have the shedding of blood. 
And here it is, Abel coming. And this is a sin in the church, is we think that we can just give God anything. We give him lame worship, lame uh, offerings, lame, and we just think God just accepts everything we do just because that's the way we want to do it. But the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. You can't do it your way. You got to do it God's way. I don't want to do it. You know, I, you, know, I, you know, I just don't think we, I don't think God talking about gathering us together in church. I don't, don't think we have to go to church. Well, that's what you think. But Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that which seemeth right. We worship at the, at the, at the altar of our own opinions. God, God, God said this is the way it's going to be done. Do you know how meticulous God was when he, when he set up the sacrifices in the Old Testament? He was so meticulous. He, 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 God is, is, is so, I mean, he's so on point. He is, he is not, when he told them, he said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. He said, I want you to kill a lamb. He told them how old the lamb had to be. He told them that they had to, where they had to put it. He said, put it over the doorpost. What, what about some people say, well, you know, I don't really, I don't really like blood on my doorpost. I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to put it on the threshold. That should be good enough for God. See, that's the way, that's, that's Cain. Cain is mad because God didn't accept his stuff and praise God because he wanted to do it his way. And God said, uh-uh. He said, now you do it my way, I'll accept it. Now go over there and ask your brother for one of his flock, kill it and bring it to me. I'm paraphrasing, and I'll accept it. But, 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 but don't, 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 don't bring me no more okra and Brussels sprouts. Don't bring the fruit of the ground. I don't want it. I cursed it already. Why are you bringing me the accursed thing? And so the way of Cain, that way will, you'll lose every time because you want to do it your way. Some folk, don't, they, they just don't think God's way is, well, why would God, why would God restrict me from this particular activity or this particular sin? Why is he trying to withhold something good from me? No, but it's God's way. And so the way of Cain was the way of, I will do worship God the way I want to worship God and he has to accept it or I'm not going to change and we know the story he ended up killing his brother and in the church there could be so much envy of others until praise God and my father used to always tell us he said that, that uh, uh, the Bible teaches that he that curses his brother is a murderer and he said you can kill people with your mouth he said you can commit murder with your mouth and so we have to be very careful that we don't murder people with our mouths and then it says they ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward in the amplified it says it like this it says that they have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain it offers them, following the error of Balaam. Now, most of us know who Balaam is, especially in the prophetic church. Balaam was the prophet that was, that, that uh, uh, Balak uh, of the Moabites asked to come, and he told him, I will pay you to prophesy against Israel. I'll pay you. You, you, can, you. you can read it when you have a chance. It's, it's in Numbers, the 22nd chapter. And he said, he said I'll, pay, I'll pay you for it. Do you know the church, we cannot get to the point where it's all about money. And I'm tired of prophets prophesying money out of folks' pocket into their pocket. This ain't about money. 
You know, I, I'm, oh, I got to get that prophet to come. They know how to raise offerings. Look, let me tell you something. It's nothing wrong with raising offerings. It's nothing wrong with giving. It's nothing wrong with admonishing people to give. But we cannot tie our gift to money. You cannot tie your message to money. Like one preacher said, he said he preached one message on sin and half of the people left his church. He said, I ain't going to never do that again. And I thought to myself, I said, you can't tie, because he was looking at those ties. He was counting nickels and noses. I don't count nickels and noses. I preach what God says preach because I'm going to have to stand before God and he's going to judge me. And he's not going to say, how many people did you have in your congregation? He said, I ain't going to never preach about sin. I'm not going to preach about that no more. You know, so basically, they, he preaches real, you know, you're going to be blessed. I'm blessed. God loves you. God loves you, me. We are God's family, little Barney messages. But Balaam... The church is, if the church is not careful, we, you know, and the, and the, and the prophets and the apostles, I'm, I'm calling out us too, where it's all about money. It's all about, you know, how many, how many people, and you get, here, here it is, you know, you, you ask some, you get, you're, you're going to get somebody to come. This years ago, we get trying to get people to come to speak, and sometimes this is what they say, you know. Uh, well, you know, we want you to come and speak, at, you know, at our church, you know, uh, and so on. How many you running, Doc? <laughs> you know what they're asking? How many people do you have? Because they're looking at nickels and noses. They're looking at how many people they got so they how much money they can get. And so the Bible talks about that. It calls it the error of Balaam. And there is an error in the church that, that has almost got to the point where we measure the success of everything by how much money somebody got or how much money the church has or how, how much wealth the, the church has. That, that, and, and Balaam got to the point where he, all, all his prophecy, you could, you could hire him for enough money. You could get him to come. I mean, one time we were having, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to close because I didn't, I didn't uh, my father said, don't, don't give a, a, a good bucket of milk and then the cow kick it over. So I don't want to kick it over. <laughs> but we have to be very careful because we're getting to, it, it, this, is, this is beginning to, to, to really come into the church. Nobody seems to be saying anything about it. I, you know, I said, Lord, I don't have a platform to say to me, you know, I, you know, maybe a few hundred people might, might hear this sermon. But the Lord has a way to get in sermons where they want to get them. He has a way of getting his message out. And so we can't be prophesying, you know, okay, I remember I, I, I had, a, I went to a service and the prophet was there, very accurate prophet well-known prophet I'm not going to say the name and this is years ago so it's probably not some of y'all's more modern day prophets and I went to the church and when I got to the to the church it was here and he had visited here in in Michigan he was at a church and I and my brother said I want you to go with me so we went and uh I met him before the service and you know and so I'm sitting there and he's preaching. but then when he gets down after he gets to preaching he says now I'm going to have uh, I want everybody uh, you know, I'm a, I want you to give a thousand. I want people to give a thousand dollars. Now, the ones I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars, and then I'm gonna give you your prophecy. So you had to bring your money up and give it while he was giving you the prophet, and then he give you the prophecy. A thousand dollars. Now, I don't have no problem with a thousand dollars. I have no problem with ten thousand dollars. I've given, I've given thousands and thousands of dollars to the kingdom of God, so I didn't have any problem with that. But I was just kind of, you know, well, you know, why has it gotta? You know, why can't we just give our offer and you just prophesy? You know, but this is a thousand and you're going, and I'm going to give you a prophecy. He tied the pro prophecy to the thousand dollars. I didn't like that. And I said, Lord, I, I was saying to the Lord, now what do you want me to give? And the Lord gave me a number to give. He gave me to give. And so it wasn't a thousand, so. 
<laughs> just happened not to be a thousand. If he told me a thousand, I would have went on and did a thousand. And so the Lord told me what to do. So he, he did that. Then he said, okay. And then those that would do, and then he went down $500. Then he went down $250, you know, and you get a prophecy. And, and, and the Lord had told me to give $50. So I said, I'm going to get my $50. So I know, I said, he ain't even going to get the $50. <laughs> I, thought, I said, I ain't getting no prophecy tonight. Because <laughs> I ain't got the prophecy money. <laughs> and so the Lord told me to give $50. Then he said, $50. I said, okay. So I got in the line. And so they're giving, and he's giving the prophecy. You give him the $50 and da, 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 da. I said, I just didn't like it. I, 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 I didn't even want to hear the prophets. I, didn't, I said, I don't want to even hear no prophets. <laughs> Do you know, I get up there to get my $50, and when I get my $50, he prophesies one of the most accurate words. I put it on. I got on tape. One of the accurate words, I mean, that, has, that, that really gave direction to my life. Now, was God confirming him? No, God was confirming his word. God will use, do you know that Balaam, Balaam, a donkey, became a prophet to him? Because the Bible says when he was going down there to get his money and get his prophecy, that the, the donkey that he was on saw the angel there before him and stubbed him against the wall. He got mad at the donkey and was going, and then the donkey spoke. God can cause a donkey to prophesy. Don't get all of, don't get all into pride because God, the donkey prophesied to him. Donkey said, "Haven't I always obeyed you?" Can you imagine your donkey, you, you, your dog, start talking to you? God can get this message over. The, and 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 uh, so. Don't get caught up in, in all of these prophetic, you know, uh, I'm going to be your prophet. Uh, you know, send me, you know, $1,000 every month and I'm going to give you six prophecies that's going to change your life. Don't pay no attention to that stuff. I'm telling you, that's the, that's the, the error of Balaam. You, you, you give me the profit, and then I'm, you're going to get three new cars and two houses. Why don't you just give your tithe at the church, and the windows of heaven will open over you? That came out of the, the uh, sure word of prophecy. Let me finalize this. And the gang saying have perished with the rebellion. In, in the Amplified, it says rebellion like Korah. And this is, this is, I see this in the church. This is one of the, 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 the things that I believe God is, is causing us to deal with in the church is this Korah. Korah, you, I'm not going uh, to go to um, Numbers, but Numbers 16, when you get a chance, you can read it. Korah was, was, was a, a Levite. And the Levites came to Moses while they were in the wilderness, and, and they said to Moses, you and Aaron are taking too much on yourself. You and Aaron are, 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 are lording over us. And we feel like that we are just as anointed, just as graced as you are. And they came to him and said that we want the office of the priesthood. In other words, rebellion against leadership. There is rebellion against godly leadership. And everybody many times want a position. Folk, everybody wants to be the leader. In, in the church, we got, we got competitive people competing for leadership in the church. If they can't get what they want here, they'll go to another church and get it. If, they, if you don't put them over the mint ministry, over the handkerchief ministry, they will go to another church and be over the mint ministry and the handkerchief ministry. Because they want position. 
And they rebelled against Moses. They said, y'all, you take too much upon yourself. When God sets leaders, I learned this a long time ago. You just leave. When God sets leaders over you, that, that you better be careful how you deal with that leader. And, you, and, and not rebel against that leader. Because that's, that is very dangerous. Because when God sets a leader in place, it's because God set them, not the leader. Not true leaders. God set them there. Sometimes they didn't even want to be there. I don't know about you, I didn't even want to be here. I was doing fine. We men in Sudoku was doing fine before this. I told the Lord, I'm doing fine. We were, we were going on vacations and cruises, and my Lord, we was having a ball. I said, Lord, is this really you? But they rebelled against Moses. They came against Moses. They came against Aaron because they wanted the priesthood. And, and Moses said, don't y'all Levites know that God has given you the oversight of the temple. Why do you now want to take the high priest job from Moses, I mean, from Aaron and his lineage? Because it was Aaron and his sons that were the high priest. Why do you want to do that? In other words, because we want to do it. You do it and we want to do it. And the Bible says that, that Moses was wrought. Moses... Moses said, tomorrow, y'all bring y'all censors. Get y'all censors and bring them out here. And, 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 and we're going to see who God has called. Sometimes God has to put to the test. Sometimes God has to show that this is his leader. And, and Moses said to bring out the censors. And it says that, that I believe it was Dathan was one of the, 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 the ones that had gotten the people together. They had gotten a whole group together. It wasn't just Korah. It was a whole group. They had already got, they had got a group out of the Israelites. They had got a group together that they were, that came against them. It's not like they just came up. They didn't got a, 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 a whole group in the church that's now against the pastor. I, I wonder sometimes, I, I, to me it's, it's, it's very odd, but I, I said this to Sister Hogan, I said, honey, how is it that people can love you one moment and hate you the next moment? How is it that the same people that, 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 that you love so much, because I, I still love many of the, of the, of the, co -cons of the conspirators and the co-conspirators <laughs> that have divided the church, I love them today. If they called me, I'd be there in a minute. But I said, what, what do we do? What is it that all of a sudden you loved me yesterday, but now you hate me? I'm the same leader. I have not changed. It's because it didn't go your way. Because you wanted Cain. You wanted your way. And it ain't going to go your way. It goes God's way. And they got together and and when they, uh, Dathan wouldn't even come out of his tent. He wouldn't even come out. He said, Moses said, y'all come on out here. He, he wouldn't even come out. He did disrespected him. And so God came down and God said, now this is what I'm going to do. I'm killing all of these Israelites. I'm killing everybody. See, <laughs> see, that's the God. I, I know, like, like uh, um, uh, Oprah said, I wouldn't serve a God like that. Well, you don't have no choice because there ain't no other God. He's God and God all by himself. You can't find no other God. You, okay, you don't serve this one. You serve yourself. Praise God. He's the one in control. He's the one that created us. I wouldn't serve a God that, that sends judgment. Well, I'll tell you what. In this nation, when somebody commits murder, I want them in prison. I want judgment. I want, them to, I want them to take them to court, take them off the street so they don't kill nobody else. Judgment is a part of life. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. So he got them, got them together. And got, his, got them together. Dathan wouldn't even come out. And God said, I'm going to kill all of them. And Moses fell down on his face. We talked about cover. He fell down on his face. And Moses said, Lord, don't are you going to destroy everybody? Even the ones that didn't do wrong, that wasn't with Korah? And so God said, okay, tell them this. Tell, them, tell the people, get away from the tents of Korah. 
get away. Everybody get away from them because I'm about to do something here. I'm not going to kill everybody, but I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> somebody going down. And he said, get away from them. So when, they, when, when the people separated from them, Moses said to them, Moses said, now, God's, God says, that this, is, this is what I'm saying. If they die a natural death, then, then you know God has not called me. But if they die an unusual death, and the Bible says that the earth opened up. Earth opened up, and them, their children, they, they cows, their everything died, went into the earth and went uh, into the heart of the earth, and all of them were killed. The sad thing about it is, is that when you read this, the Bible says the next day, folk came to Moses and said, you didn't kill people. <laughs> Can you imagine that? If I seen God open up the earth and drop folk down in there, the next day I'd be on my knees, be in church be on the usher board, be everything, I'm going to be everything. God. I mean, these folks rebellious the next day. They got mad, some other folk got mad at him. And, and so you wonder sometimes, but I, I realize that's a part of leadership. Folks will love you today and hate you tomorrow. They'll think you, they'll think you, you the greatest pastor in the world today. Tomorrow they'll be ready to stone you. It's, it, 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 it's, it's par for the course. And the Bible says that God <laughs> was upset. In fact, I believe it's the 24th verse of Numbers. And let me, let me, let me just turn over there for a minute. I'm closing. I know this is my third close. <laughs> uh, sometimes we, we really need to, to just rethink some things. In, uh, it says that the next, the next day, I believe it's, a, okay, um, Let's look at verse number, see, verse number 32 talks about the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men and so on and so forth. And said, and they all, and all that are appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished among the congregation. And then in verse 41 it says, but on tomorrow, on tomorrow, the next day, all the congregation of the children murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, ye have killed the people of the Lord. He didn't kill them. God killed them. And so they gathered around, the Bible says, and it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle and the congregation, and behold, a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of congregation, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. There, here he is again. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer. He's a, now he's making a sacrifice for the people. He's covering them. Do you know how many times that leaders have to cover people that's trying to kill them? How you have to, hey, you cannot, I, I, I tell you, I cannot get into strife and envy. I can get into these things because I have to be able to minister to people wherever they are. I cannot, a leader, a true leader does not praise God all of a sudden because somebody's mad at them. All of a sudden they turn, praise God, and turn on them. This is, is, is a, it, Moses is now taking a censor of Aaron and going and making a sacrifice for the people in order to keep God from destroying all of them. 
You can't get it. And, 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 and let me just say this as I close. It, it, you cannot get to the point where you get mad at, at where you get mad at people and get into strife and get into in uh, into uh, a, a grudge or holding a, an ought against people that do you wrong. The Bible says, "Pray for those that despitefully use you, bless those that curse you." A, 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 a true leader, even though they may be hurt, even though they may be wounded by people. They, they, they have to get healed as quickly because those same people, God has made you an overseer of those people. He's made you, uh, how can I say, he's made you to minister to those very people. And so you cannot get, leaders cannot get up uh, and get so angry and so mad at people until you, don't, you can't minister to people. Korah died in his rebellion. Now, oh, there's two scriptures the Lord gave me. I'm gonna, let me finish with these two scriptures. Turn with me to Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6. Because, because I, I want to just share with you, we, we must commit to doing it God's way. We must commit to the faith that was once delivered. We must commit to the Bible, to the word of God, to godly leadership. And we need to do it God's way. Say, do it God's way. You got to do it God's way. You can't do it your way. Uh, on, in, in, in Jeremiah, these are two scriptures. Old folks used to read these scriptures. And, uh, and so I'm going to use them as the final thing for us to focus on doing what we do God's way. Look at, look at the sixth chapter of Jeremiah and, and the 16th verse. This is what you better do. It says, this is in the New Living Translation. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel in its path and you will find rest for your soul. In other words, it says, in, in the King James Version, it says, thus says, stand ye in the ways and see. Ask for the old path. I know y'all think I'm old-fashioned. I might be old-fashioned, but I'm on the foundation. Where is the good way? And walk therein. Ye shall find rest for your soul. But he said, I will not walk therein. Turn to Isaiah 35. This is what we better, we better get back to. We better find out the right way and do it God's way, the right way. Get off this doing our own thing. I did it my way. No, you got to do it God's way. Because the road that you take, the road that you take will determine your outcome. Verse 8 says in Isaiah 35, and a highway shall be there and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring man, though fools shall not err therein. Let me read it in the, in the New Living Translation. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the highway of holiness. Evil-minded people will never travel on it. And it will be only for those who walk in the ways Fools will never walk there. In Isaiah 55, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return. 
And then the Bible says, for my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heaven is above the earth, so high as my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. You may not understand God's way. You may look at the Bible and it may seem contrary to the way you feel, to the way you do what you desire, but that's God's way. It's different from our way. And we must accept his way, praise God. We must accept his way of doing things. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's stand in the house of the Lord. Stand up. Stand up. Contend for the faith. Fight for this, for the faith. I don't care what anybody, you have to decide for yourself, no matter what any, I don't care what other, all these progressive churches that are so progressive, moving away from the foundational teachings of the word of God, don't follow that. Don't follow the popular trends of the church now. Where you can, there is no sin anymore. Yes, there is sin. And the Bible says, all souls are mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need to, to accept. And that's why we need the grace of God, not just his favor, but his power. Whatever area that you're struggling in, and, and we all struggle in the areas of our life, is we need to ask God for more grace. I need more power in that area of my life. I need more anointing in that area of my life. And God will come right there. He will come right there and deal with it right there. Lift your hands. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the foundations of our faith that was given to us by the apostolic fathers, by your disciples that walked with you. Jesus, we know, Lord, that there is a way that seems right to us, but it's not your way. It's a way that, that makes sense to us, but it doesn't, it's not your way. Help us to embrace your way the word of God completely. Father, we need grace. Not just your favor, but your power. Power of a changed life. You said they had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. The power to bring us into healing and wholeness deliverance from sin and from the vices that we have in our lives we're not there yet Lord but we're asking for grace to overcome every sin every weight every struggle that we're having you can get with us in our struggle and help us through our struggles some of us are struggling in areas, Father. We love you, but we're struggling in these areas of our life. We don't deny that we're wrong, Lord, but we say, Father, give us grace to overcome these areas of our lives. And we're willing to fight for it. We're willing to fight to get out of this mess. We're willing to fight to break the yoke of this sin. We're willing to fight in prayer and fasting the word of God denying ourselves deliverance so that we can be set free to walk in holiness before you. Lord, we thank you for grace. The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness, we've got to deny it. We've got to deny it. We deny ungodliness. We turn away from it. And worldly lust, we turn away from it. Father, we ask for your grace to live soberly, righteously, godly. In this present world, we can do it. It can be done.
Thank you, Jesus. Come on, put your hands together and give God praise.